Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. I am Gabriella Handel, a draftsman and the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 36, and I will have this conversation with artist John Wellington. If you'd like to support this podcast, liking and sharing this video is a great way to do it, and so is subscribing. If you want to support my work, including the work that I do with this podcast, you can also purchase my drawings directly from my website, buy my crafts from eBay, buy prints of my drawings, or leave a tip. The links for these things are in the in the video description in the video caption description. I'm sure those are synonyms. Thank you very much for watching and listening, and enjoy the episode. All right, so John Wellington, welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 36. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Okay, my name is John Wellington. I'm an artist living in New York City and uh, I've been an artist of some sort or another since I guess I was a little child, uh, or at least wanting to be. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, whether that was going to be an illustration or in comic books or uh, strip, some, somehow I was just always drawing and uh, to sort of find my connection to the world since I was about two years old. Uh huh. So do you remember stuff from when you were two or? Yeah, yeah, even earlier. That seems really far back. Yeah. Some people seem to have that skill or, I mean, not skill, but they somehow somehow just seem to be able to remember really far back into their childhood. I think I remember until like uh, from before like four or something. And I don't I, have I a have, super good memory. I, I have a terrible memory, like <laughs> a horrible memory, like the, just the worst. And I've always had like for like spelling tests, things like that in school, mm -hmm. but I have, I've had very strong visual memory going back before my first birthday. Wow, that's very, that's fascinating. I feel like maybe you probably should write a, some kind of book about that. Uh, I'm not sure of book, but I think it's definitely comes out of my art. And, yeah, okay. And there's certainly images I've used in my art that were from before I was uh, two years old. Like um, there were some paintings I was doing in college where I was obsessed with the chevron pattern, the black and yellow chevron. It's almost like a military uh -huh. pattern. And it was, I remember that Chevron pattern in, uh, in uh, West Hollywood. I want to look uh, that up. I want to uh, look up the Chevron. So you it was on me. a gate that okay. I remember as a little kid before I was two years old. And that was before we moved off to France. So when we were still in, I was still in the States. Is it, is it like the kind of like really open V? It's a V. Yeah. Usually it's a V go, uh, going upright you know, with the point at the top, but it can be an upside down chevron. Okay, interesting. All right. Um, okay, so would you would you mind going over kind of like a, hmm, I don't know, a, a summary, I guess, of like the stages that you've gone through sure. uh, in your artistic expression? Right, I, I'll start, I'd like to start off like really young because I feel, well, I've written about this, but I, I feel that there's a difference between amateur and professional. Mm -hmm. And often uh, the word amateur is used in such a derogatory term, like, oh, he's such an amateur. Or, she's yeah. An amateur. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, I think it's like the greatest compliment you can have because, mm -hmm. right, because the Latin root, you know, and I know your, your first language is, is Spanish mm -hmm. and Latin and, you know, amor, amora. Is and, that where that comes from? That makes sense. The AMA is there. Yeah, it's the love, the love of doing something is an amateur. And as a little kid, uh, I grew up with um, artistic parents. My, my dad was a, uh, a sort of like a beatnik poet, uh, uh, an artist, an artist photographer with his Leica and then an avant-garde filmmaker. And, you know, and they hung out with like all the jazz musicians of the time, like people like Ornette, Col um, Ornette Coleman. And this was like their whole group and Ferris Gallery in Los Angeles. Okay. And, you know, like De DeFeo, you know, who did the big white flowers, a really good friend of my dad's and all, all of these artists in the 50s and 60s in, North in Northern California, LA, then Europe, and then Greenwich Village, 
where I eventually grew up. And so I grew up in like a kind of 60s artistic community of, uh, you know, abstract artists and avant-garde jazz musicians like Ornette and um, filmmakers like Gordon Parks Jr. who later did the movie uh, Superfly. He was, thought he was my uncle, I called him Uncle Gordy. <laughs> He's the one who got me into art. Uh, one of the people who got me into archery when I was a little kid, um, got me my first bow. Uh, and so I grew up in a very, I'd say very creative 60s world. Mm -hmm. And so certainly when I was a, as an only child drawing in the corner as a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old, it was encouraged. One is because I could entertain myself when we were at discotheques or crazy places or restaurants at 10 at night. You know, if I wasn't sleeping, they put a little piece of paper and something and I would draw. Yes. And, and so all my life, that's sort of I, all my young life, I drew out, out of love. And, okay. and the thing is that when you get older, you know, and, and, you know, and then you get, if you draw, okay, or, you know, show some sort of creativity, sometimes it gets encouraged, not in every household, but certainly in mine, it was like, yeah, it's not a, it's not a ridiculous thing to do. Mm -hmm. you know, they weren't looking for me to become a surgeon. And, yeah. uh, um, although I did think my dad did go to my freshman year at RISD, he did come up and want me to drop out to uh, join uh, special forces. He wanted me to go mm. to the military, but that was his own weird that was his own background once wanting me to be a soldier um but it, other than that like outlier moment you know wasn't discouraged but as you get older you know you go to art school or whatever your path you find yourself as a young adult and now you have to make a living and now people are like wow isn't it really difficult being an artist and you're taking your work and people talking about your body of work and you know, well, that's a nice piece. Do you have 12 more of them like that? Mm -hmm. And like, I don't even want to make 12 more of them like that. I, I want to do something else, you know, well, yeah, yeah. we're not going to show that we need 12 things that look the same and, or, oh my God, you're painting that. No one wants to see that. I was thinking about your work, you know, when you're going through the self strangulation stuff, mm -hmm. you know, which I love, but it's like, I could see a dealer going, maybe now things are changing, but I could see like someone going, no one's ever going to buy that Gabriella. And you're like, uh, well, I had to make it anyway, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, all right. I hope someone will buy it, but that's not the thing I had to make this. And I think that what happens to many of us as we get older is the things we love, the things we were amateurs about, uh, we have to be, we become professional. And what happens with professional is you start to feel practical. Well, what sells, what doesn't sell? Mm -hmm. um, what would I make that would attract the person who want a painting over their couch. And do I want to do, is that how I want to spend my time as an artist? Is that why I became an artist? And you start to think practically, or you make decisions that you know are impractical. Like, mm. oh, John, nobody's going to want to ever own that. And, you know, it's like, I've asked people for art advice when I was struggling at different times. And, you know, one person, I won't mention her name, but she looked at me uh, at a dinner party. I've seen next door, I was like, you know, I really could use your advice. I mean, we, we were in Europe and I was like, when we get back to New York, maybe you could come over and we could talk and see, I'm really mm. kind of not sure where to go. And she said, well, John, one of the things you could do is start doing paintings that people would actually want to own. <laughs> and, you know, that's probably really good advice, but you know, mm. what do you do with it? Right. Sure. And, and that's the problem is that, that when you become professional, you're not getting patted on the back anymore. Like, oh my God, Gabriella, you draw so well. Look at all the cute little things. All of a sudden, <laughs> like, well, how does this fit into the professional world? Yeah. And and so what can happen, especially if, and I'm not talking about, I mean, it can happen in any age, but I'm, I'm 61 now. So, um, you know, this has been a lot of decades. Sort of, mm -hmm. You know, it seems like I was 31, like an eye blink ago. And, right. uh, and, and a lot of decades can go by. And during those decades, there's real ups and downs. Like, why am I doing this? I mm -hmm. hate this. I hate people coming. I hate dealers coming to my studio and spending three, not like spending like 20 minutes saying your work's not right for me, but they hang out for three hours. This hasn't happened, by the way, since like the, you know, for a while. This didn't happen last week. You know, I'm, thinking, I'm talking about like 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. But they would spend like two, three hours telling me everything that's wrong with my work. And mm. you know, I'm not, I'm not like that. Get out. How dare you? You know nothing. You know, I'm, <laughs> I would sit there and go, okay. 
just take it, just listen. Maybe yeah. there's something I can get out of this, but it, it kills you on some level. And you have to, you know, you, you get wounded and, and the love of it leaves you. And so you, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I suck. My work sucks. It doesn't deserve the, I understand why people hate my work and by hating my work, meaning they hate me, you know, because people yeah, yeah. do end up hating you because of your art. You know, they don't know you. They look at your work and go, I hate the person that could make this. <laughs> they hate the messenger. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And so the amateur leaves. And so a lot of my life is finding that little child that was in the corner drawing because that little child didn't know those things. Wasn't being judged, was sort of like, Oh, isn't it so great that that little child's in the corner that we don't have to take care of? They're taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so to me, a lot of my adult journey is, is that conversation with, with who I was at eight years old mm -hmm. or 11 years old or 13, you know, more than my conversation with, I'd say I'd like to spend more time with that than I do with like the art world as it is now. Like I know, right. My son was my son who's now 31. He was just here until a few minutes ago and then mm -hmm. he left. So we do this. Um, but you know, we were just laughing at a gallery across that was across sort of schadenfreude laughing. I should say uh, there was a gallery that opened up across the street from him on 11th street uh, for NFTs. Oh, and I, by, and I was why like, why do you need a building for that? And I was like, oh, is that where the NFT gallery was? You know, when like, you remember that brief moment when it's like, aren't you, aren't you going to do NFTs? And I was like, I was just like, oh my God. And I had, you know, dear friends that are like, you know, John, I'll even hand, you know, handhold you through the process. And I was like, all right, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. And we never got to do it. And I'm so thankful, but you know, it's like, I don't like trying to keep up with the art world as it is now, I'd rather stay back with my childhood. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. It's kind of a weird way there, you know, they, you know, for the last uh, 40 years, uh, there's been something called uh, outsider art. I mean, it's gone on for outsider art's been around since grandma Moses, but uh, uh, since cave painting 60,000 years ago, excuse me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's been, outsider art started as outsider art. <laughs> yes. Um, but the term outsider art, I think it was like 40 years ago, it was like Rico Maresca Gallery. And like these artists that just created and they did their work. And most people didn't even know they were artists. You know, they died and they go like, um, uh, what's his name? Who did all the little girls and the, I'm spacing. But anyway, um, you know, Hawkins, there's all these outside artists that were, they just made art. Mm. And they weren't, and then eventually after their death or, you know, galleries then, swamped down and billionaires swamped down and all the money swamped in and people made lots of money off all these artists and uh they had great shows and everything most of the time not during their lifetime but what they did during their lifetime they had this need to create this that was outside of the art world and and they're called outsider artists because i guess the idea is that they weren't trained or they weren't this or they weren't that but really it's just that they they just didn't let the the tastes of, of fashion affect their visions. They just mm. did what they did and they just did it. And I think I'm, that's where I always have been more as an artist than um, thinking about, you know, like, oh, everybody's wearing bell bottoms. Let me design bell bottoms. Everybody's <laughs> wearing straight yeah, leg. Yeah. Let me design straight leg jeans. You know, it's kind of, I, I think, imagine this probably resonates with you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... Uh, I, uh, I definitely have, or not have, but continue to miss out on opportunities because I don't want to uh, compromise. And uh, I don't want to compromise what I, the things that I want to draw, whatever they may be, uh, regardless, in, in kind of like a bullheaded way, like in a probably unnecessarily stubborn sort of way, because I just, um, probably also because of what you're saying of like having the 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 pleasure of enjoying that childlike um the the i don't know uh, innocent enjoyment or like enjoyment without expectation enjoyment without um 
um, with, without a particular goal necessarily, or just like the enjoyment of looking for something in your drawing, in your painting, and then maybe finding it or keep looking for it, whatever it is, and then you start another drawing and you start looking for something else. And so like kind of like just 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 being submerged in that pool of childlike enjoyment. Uh, so like I kind of refuse to compromise that because I feel like that is what makes good work. Right. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, and I think that that's that thing. Like when I see your work, it's very meditative mm. and it's very I mean, it's very inward and it's also very outward, too, because it's incredibly gorgeous. Um, but it, it's uh, um, but but very meditative. Your 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 pencil marks there. There's a thing. I mean, I could say, oh, Gabriella, work faster. Do this. <laughs> But I, that's not where I, yeah, of course I could do this, but that's not where I find my meditation. My meditation is in this. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's it. So yeah, no, I know you, you'd resonate. So I, and I do think now I, I do, when I think about art and when I think about me and what I'm saying, and like I was saying, oh, I think this will resonate with you. I don't expect it to resonate with everybody. And I think mm. that one of the things I do feel about art is what works for me. And I, you know, and I've been teaching now for 30 something years and I, and you've been in my class enough times when I've been teaching. Yes. And, and even though I'm teaching very specific techniques, you know, that like, I'm really pluralistic in the way people should work or find them, their voices or their art or their art practices. And, and I think that, Art, being an artist is in this day and age where you don't have the Catholic church behind you, you know, you know, giving you commissions to, you know, do a painting of Saint Maurice or whoever. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's such, I, I think of it as my glorious folly because I do think it's glorious. And I also think it's a folly, but I do feel for me that if I'm going to do something as absurd with my art as be a fine artist, meaning have these images that pop up in my head that I feel need to be born. And then I'm going to spend an absurd amount of time working on one painting, you know, and mm -hmm. correcting and correcting until someone thinks I'm actually good. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that that's the, that's the path I've chosen. And I think that for that path, that the only time I will veer from that path is never on speculation. Like I will never do a painting thinking that maybe there's the, this market, I'll do this painting for this market. Mm. Um, I never will, I can, can't do that. When I have no skill for it, uh, yeah. which probably, but I will for, but you know, if you pay me a hundred thousand dollars, I'll, I'll paint a Damien Hirst for you. I'll paint your Oh pattern. yeah, for sure. I'll paint, you know, if you say, <laughs> Same. Don, I'll give you, here's $750,000. I'm like, I'll paint the outside of your house. I mean, it doesn't <laughs> right. matter, you know, so, but I'm just not going to do it if the money's not in my bank account, like I'm not yeah. going to try and guess what these people on, you know, Upper East Side are going to buy, or those people in Paris are going to buy, or what that person in Monaco is going to buy, or what the taste will be next week, or what it was last week, you know, or, yeah. you know, and, and I, and I will say the other thing I also wanted in my art is I never wanted to be school of, uh, I never mm -hmm. wanted you know, people always say, well, how do I, I'm trying to find my style. I'm trying mm. to find my style. I want it, our, I, you know, Rembrandt's the best artist ever. Nobody ever paints as well as Rembrandt. He's the greatest painter ever. And they do these amazing paintings that look Rembrandt-like. Mm. And that's great. But then you go, oh, wow. You look at their paintings and go, wow, yeah, yeah Rembrandt, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. And, and, and I guess the two things I, I wanted was, one, I didn't want to worry about my style. Because mm. I think that that's like, uh, well, I mean, not that I probably worry about my personality probably more than I worry about my style. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, it's like worrying about who am I as a person, which is, of course, we do. Like, how do we relate to other people? How are we? Why does this person dislike me? Why does this person love me? Mm. Why does, you know, what, what, are, what is our purpose here? So that part, I think, is in concern. But as far as my art style, I feel that that's such an extension of me that that I wouldn't think about my style. If I wanted to change my style, I would change me as a human. Yeah. And, and the other thing I think of is if someone wants to, like if I have students that say, saying they're trying to find their style, I would say, um, look at art. I'd say one, do art, you know, mm -hmm. just do stuff because that's your style. But then when you go to museums, look at art and 
and look at art that will help you in your vision. Like, you know, like if you're like for me, like I, you know, like, I, of course, I've looked at Ang and I look at Shashiro and Vermeer and Velasquez and uh, Turner and Giovanni Bellini, I think is like, and, and, um, but I also look at Basquiat and I look at mm. uh, Anselm Kiefer and I look at, and, and just mix up all your genres, you know, like just throw everything and, and fall in love and be seduced. Like, you know, when I'm in the Basquiat show, um, you know, I, I've been seduced by Basquiat's work now since like 82 or 81. He was, this is on the, he was the first person I ever got stoned with, ah. but it was before he was Jean-Michel Basquiat. Just uh -huh. then it was even before he started writing Samo. It was in, uh, 1975 mm. and I was 14 years old. And I think he was either 15 or 16. He was, he was still in high school. He was at city of school. So he wasn't Jean-Michel Basquiat. He was just a kid like me who loved drawing comic books stuff. And we both had our sketch art notebooks filled with comics. Wait, so you knew him personally? I, my, a very good friend of mine was a best friend of his. I see. So we hung out, but I went, by the time he blew up, you know, in 1980, um, I didn't know him. I'd see him in clubs, but I mm. was friends with him. That's you know? crazy and awesome. <laughs> so I knew, nice. him, I knew him before he dropped out of CAS. Okay. Um, um, but, but I guess, oh, so just to finish, I would say just looking at like lots of diverse art. And if you're seduced, not just by Rembrandt, but if you're seduced by Rembrandt and then you're seduced by, uh, de Kooning's woman, number one, mm. you know, and then, you know, you're seduced by, you know, de Chirico, or you're seduced by, uh, Tamar de Lampica. If you're seduced in so many different directions in one way, you, you don't know what direction to go in other than your own. But if you only have one artist, like, and it's like, no, and you're arguing, like, it's like, uh, you're talking, like, arguing rocks, like, who's the best guitarist, you know, like, that, that <laughs> yes. silly conversation. Um, you, you, you might, it's more tempting to ape that style of your favorite guitarist than if you have a hundred guitarists that are great, mm -hmm. because then why would you ape this one when you really want to ape all 100? Mm -hmm. So when I'm painting, I want to ape uh, Van Gogh and I want to ape, Basquiat and I want to ape uh, Giovanni Bellini and and everybody you know I just mm -hmm. want to ape, and basically what I want to ape is power and uh, and beauty and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, that's really what I want to ape is I want I want to give to myself in my paintings the same awe and pleasure that I get from all of their art mm. that's really what I want I want to give myself when I finish a work to the best um, I want when we hang, you know, when Evelyn, my wife and I hang our work up, um, I want to look at it sometimes at nighttime and go feel like someone else painted it and it be like, wow, that's, that's really fun to look at, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I want to make a meal basically that I want to eat. <laughs> yes. That's basically what we did. Okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, the thing, the thing about, um, what you were saying about the different art and what people pretending like they know what's going to sell or what isn't going to sell um and and like what you were saying about the the art world as it is now um but i mean in in, in my opinion it's really just like the art world in general I, I feel like that attitude of pretending like anybody knows what is going to sell that has always and I mean, not that I know that much about the art, art world or anything, but whenever I hear conversations about it, I mean, I remember in school, um, my classmates would be like, yeah, no, you have to use bright colors or no, you have to, you can't, you can't do portraits because of whatever, because they're making assumptions. Like they're making like their own, every individual make their own assumptions about what they think is gonna sell because they're thinking about selling stuff or whatever. And it's like, you really, it's like, I have such a hard time believing it's like the stock market or something. It's like, I have such a hard time believing that anyone, I don't care who it is, uh, gallerist, curator, uh, another artist, uh, uh, historian or whatever it is. I have such a very hard time believing that these individuals will know, will have a smidge of an idea of what is going to sell. Cause it's it, like, it, there's it, so many variables. There are, there are. So there, there's that's just a couple of things. One, I remember, uh, this, uh, 
dealer he had a gallery in in soho back when i was at the academy uh on alexander f milliken gallery closed it was a lovely gallery mm. and um and i i i was uh going to be given a show there I, I showed some paintings there but he came over and i was pay i was living in greenpoint brooklyn at the time this was like um in the early 80s and it was in the 80s and uh so greenpoint at the time was a little different than greenpoint now there was uh, it's like razor wire everywhere and abandoned factories and uh -huh. you know it's wild i loved it and so of course my work even to this day but there was razor wire and barbed wire and lots of skulls and um i i can't remember if i was painting uh, nude men but i remember him telling me he goes john these are the three things you never paint don't paint barbed wire don't paint skulls and don't paint penises. <laughs> and I just like, it just stuck with me. I mean, I just oh, thought yeah. it was funny. Um, yeah, I mean, I, okay. So I think two ways. I think that like taste, the taste makers, I'll call them taste makers, right? Mm. I do think that they are taste makers in a way that they can uh, to a certain degree manipulate flavors you know like in mm. fashion like forecasting like they yeah. tell you what the color is going to be and then all of a sudden everybody's wearing that green or that orange you know first comes out with this and i think in the art world too i mean when you have a, a larry gagosian for example who has galleries you know all over and if he picks you up as an artist and then you, you know they manipulate to make sure that your work goes at auction they make sure that there's people there to bid on the work to buy it and get news and you know, and then you get Damien Hirst level numbers. And, and there's a lot of sort of, um, I would say stock manipulation. Mm. And it, it's a very unregulated world. It's a really fun world, I guess, because it's it's not regulated. And mm -hmm. you, can, you know, you can manipulate in ways that aren't, that are in gray areas. I'd like this, the SEC is not gonna come down on you and you can mm. hide money and free, you can hide your money <laughs> and pay yeah, it. Yeah in free ports. And so I think more than ever, the art market can be manipulated and tastes can be made. Now, then the outlier comes. I mean, there's always gonna be somebody that they didn't predict sure. that can make it. Or there can just be, you know, the outside artists that like, like uh, the uh, sort of uh, religious, the Christian artist uh, Kincaid, mm. uh, who did the, you know, what was he called? The master of light or something. He'd do those cottages at five o'clock. He eventually died in a drunken car accident, but he uh -huh. put Bible verses. But this was a guy at one time, he was the most wealthy artist in America because mm. he had like those, he had the Kincaid malls across America and he would go on cruises and people would always buy reproductions and he had like a whole bunch of assistants that um would paint on his printed canvases like a couple of things to mass mm -hmm. light them and he was making more money than any artist in america and he was shunned and despised by the art you know by what we think of as the art world you know he was okay. nowhere to be seen in that art world so there are all these there are always outliers who are doing great um because they're not trying to play by the game that we're in. Mm. Uh, they're just, you know, he was, his market were people that never stepped into a real gallery or mm. went to the Met or, you know, sort of like the Bob Ross world, right? And, <laughs> uh, you know, but there is that. But I, I would say that these, the, 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 the few top players can, um, you know, like if you get into a good, good, if Larry picks you up, there's a good chance your prices are going to quadruple and there's a good chance, you know, all of a sudden you're going to be at the Venice Biennial and you'll mm -hmm. be at, uh, you'll, you know, you'll be in Switzerland, you'll be, you know, you'll be at Basel and, you know, there's, there are those people, it's like Hollywood, right? You know, you get the sure. right producer, you get, but I, you know, that happens. And for the people that that happens, uh, a lot of them deserve it, you know, like, you know, Jenny Saville and uh, Ansel Kiefer. And, you know, there's a bunch of a really amazing artists that, have gotten picked up in that flow and they just, you know, I look at their work and it's like, yeah, fantastic. Yes. Um, and then of course uh, there's a lot of artists that don't get it. And I think that's the way it's, you know, the, it's always been. And uh, yeah. some of that has to be with uh, people being in the artistic zeitgeist of the moment, you know, like I don't think like artists like Takashi Murakami or 
Damien Hurst or Jeff Koons or, you know, all, I call them manufacturer artists because manufacturers mm. because they don't actually, they are not artisans. Yeah. Their, their pleasure in art is not in crafting the art. That's mm. not where they get their joy. Like I was talking about how you, you know, you render, if I could say, Gabriella, you know what? I'm going to make you really rich. We're going to, you're never going to have to draw again. We got, we have some people from the Academy and we have some people from uh, Florence Academy and we got them. We've taught them how to do your drawings. Mm -hmm. You just tell them, show them photos you want drawn and they'll do them. And uh, just, but we want bigger and we want more pieces uh, coming out of you a year. I mean, maybe you'd get tempted with the money, but maybe you'd be like, oh my God, this will screw me for life because the actual artisanship of me moving and not knowing what my next stroke is going to be and oh, this looks bad, how do I fix this? And mm. all of these highs and lows of your creating might be so integral to why you do this that if I was just to throw money at you, maybe it'd be great to throw money. You can drive around in your Lamborghini and, uh, you know, but, um, but maybe the essential part of why you make art would be taken away from you. But mm. I don't think like with people like Damien Hurst or Jeff Koons, that the essential part of their making art is with the artisanship. Mm -hmm. Their essential part of making art is like have like it being an ad in advertising, like they're ad people and they they come up. With, they're super smart people. They're visually wild and creative and they're funny. And, you know, uh, people like Murcio Catalan and Weiwei, the, you know, they, you know, Weiwei's, I, you know, fun. It's going to give the finger in front of, uh, you know, um, the Forbidden City or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Tom Sachs does a. Uh, an inflatable uh, butt plug and calls it Christmas tree, you know, and Klaus von Dome and, you know, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so Duchampian humor, that dirty frat boy humor, mm -hmm. like, yeah, what I got away with, and, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and they're having a lot, they're having a lot of fun and it, but I think it also is true to who they are. So I don't look at them like I might go, I'm not that into frat boy humor art, but that's a personal thing, but I don't think they're selling out or I don't think they're not true to them. I feel mm -hmm. they, but I feel like if I was like, oh my God, okay, the formula is for me to stop painting. I'm if I need to do paintings, I'll do what Damien Hurst does. I will, mm -hmm. you know, get a bunch of people from art school that all paint figuratively well. I'll tell them what I want to paint. I'll give them the photographs. I'll have someone, you know, what Damien um, Jeff Koons does too. He has a whole painting department, and <laughs> yeah. uh, and you know, and a whole bunch of others. We have friends who paint yes. everybody's paintings, and another artist who I won't mention because they have all signed contracts of secrecy. Mm -hmm. about this artist um i haven't but, signed anything <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah no other people have yeah um, yeah no go ahead um so uh but i think that uh that those artists didn't sell out because they have no they don't get the pleasure that you and i get from the artisanship or the idea like i wouldn't know how to outsource my paints because i never know what my next stroke is going to be mm -hmm. when i have my brush in my hand I don't know what my color is going to be or what my stroke is going to be or where I'm even going to be on the painting necessarily second to second. So I don't even know how, if I had to codify that for somebody, my paintings would no longer look like my paintings. Maybe yeah. they'd be better, but they certainly wouldn't be my work anymore. Mm -hmm. And I probably would miss the little boy, which is yeah. why the childhood. Yeah, he'd be gone. <laughs> yeah. That, that kid is gone. I mean, that kid would be, you know, um, you know, living, a, probably dying young from having lived too fast and, <laughs> and uh, you know, blowing through all that money. I don't think I would have handled it. And um, so I, it's not my, the manufacturers and I enjoy going to the shows. I find a lot of the artists like awesome for selfies and just have a good time around. Yeah. Um, but it has nothing to do with why I'm an artist. And that is where the art world has been. I mean, if you, if you look at 90% of the artists that are like the top artists, most of them don't do their own work. Most of them are not yeah. artisanal. Then and then and then there's the exceptions. Um, so that's the first thing, uh, and that's why I think I keep going back to amateur, mm -hmm. is because when I start to think too professionally, I so don't belong in the art world of now. I just don't belong, and yeah. I can't belong where it is. It's like a, it's like trying to make sushi in Rome in 1970, <laughs> yeah, you know, like they wouldn't eat it. it. It just would be too, now you, in, in Rome, I'm sure there's a few sushi places. I lived there in 1981. I lived there in 81. There was mm -hmm. no sushi places. They, they, they wouldn't have understood it. 
it would have been outside of their comprehension, you know, yeah. and, and I feel like um, it's not that they don't get my work, of course, figurative art is around and there's other reasons why my work can be hated. Uh, but, um, but it's certainly like when these people have seen my work, they just look at it like, what are you even, what are you even doing? Mm -hmm. and, and so it's either I have to change or I have to just figure out how to keep finding that little boy, you know, keep believing mm -hmm. that little kid. Yeah. And, uh, I, I feel like everything I'm saying to you, you're probably like, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, of, co of course it sounds you, right. I I agree with you. I definitely agree with you in those aspects. Um, I don't agree about the um, Damien Hurst people. Oh, uh, and that ilk, but but let's not give them airtime. Okay. Um, let's let's um, I want to uh, now, Mr. Wellington, I'd like to know what is art in your opinion? Okay, uh, art. Uh, I knew you, you had uh, to uh, viewers or listeners, uh, Gabriella had warned me that she was going to ask me this question. <laughs> And I have so no answer for this. <laughs> I don't know what art is. Um, I mean, I don't. I, I don't. I, I mean, I think that as soon as you try and define it, you've ruined it in a weird way. And, uh -huh. and you no, know, I will say, I will. This is what I'll say. I will say that humans, um, we are the. We are, as far as I know, the ultimate yin and yang on this earth. And um, we, uh, we can do a lot of destruction and a lot of really crappy things mm -hmm. uh, on personal levels. There's serial killers and rapists and murderers and racists and just bad humans, bad actors, as uh, politicians like to say. And on large scales, we can do horrible things. We can go to the village across the river and rape and pillage and decimate them until that tribe no longer exists or that country no longer exists. And mm -hmm. we're watching. And in you know the thousands upon thousands of years of human existence, it doesn't seem to change. You can't, you know, if you were, if I'm able to look out my window right now where I just see scaffolding and uh, no bombs going off and no uh, shootings at this moment, you know, that's a wonderful moment. Yeah. And because there's a lot of crap that has gone on, not because America is a bad place or Panama is a bad place or, you know, France is a bad place, but because humans can do very bad things in all places at different periods of time. Mm -hmm. Now, the yang, yin to the yang of that is that humans could also do these incredibly beautiful things. And these beautiful things are not just to grab a fish out of the water and go hump, <laughs> but to think about putting it over a fire, to think eventually of finding salt or a pepper or doing things of seasoning food, of making sushi. I mean, this, you know, when was sushi, what it was like a street food, right? They mm -hmm. put your fingers, I was wrapped. That's what the niguri, the seaweed was. Yeah. You could grab with your fingers. And, you know, all these different, we, we think about things like food. We thought about rhythms. So, you know, my, my 15 year old little baby is already doing rhythm. And, and I say dance and she dances. It's like, expressing yourself through dance and through making clapping your hands or banging something or eventually carving out something and putting a filament so you can play something or making music sound out of using your voice in different ways to make sound to sing and singing in you know whether it's throat singing like in you know in mongolia or you know or, or you know Freddie yes. Mercury singing or you yes. know David Bowie or whoever it's just it's wild and then you had like 40 50,000 years ago people making markings in caves and not just markings like gorgeous drawings of bison and horses and not only doing it in the caves these caves they didn't live in there's no I've been in three of the caves I've been in Fontagone Mm -hmm. 40,000 years old I've been in um, uh, Perderac and I've been in Lascaux all before they closed and like the last one was um, in 2006 in Fontagone before they closed it to the public. And 
There, not only did they do paintings in the caves, they did it on convexities of the stone and concavities of the stone. And they did it by torchlight, which flickers. So when you looked at these drawings of, of uh, like uh, bison, mm -hmm. they, the, the convexities and concavities in the flicker made them look 3D and animated. So 40,000 years ago, they were doing virtual, you know, Oculus Quest 2 yeah, imagery yeah. in caves that they were not living in. No signs of bones, no signs of food, no signs of cooking. They went in there to make art, to record experiences. Now you could say, well, they, and by the way, they have no idea why. They, their books, this, this book says by these incredibly knowledgeable archeologists or you know, experts in this say, they did it for this reason. And this book says they did it for that reason. And they, they have all their arguments and all the reasons. And who knows? Yeah. I mean, either they're right or they're right, or they're both right to different levels. But whatever the reasons, these are the images they're making. And then you look throughout history and you'll look at even weapons like crossbows. And along the crossbows is incredible carvings of hunting scenes. And so even weapons of destruction, swords, samurai armor, beautiful artistry, not to just mention artistry in fabrics and textiles and finding colors. So what is art? I don't know. Art is the yin to the yang that we need so that we don't only focus all the time and all the crap we do. But that art isn't just painting. That art is cooking. It's music. It's textiles. It's gardening. It's, it's appreciating an arrangement of flowers and saying, hey, if I put this grouping of plants together, this is going to be pleasing to me or pleasing to people in the town square. It's architecture. It's it's not just like I need a place, some sticks to survive, but can I decorate these sticks to look nicer? If, if it's a cloth around a teepee shape, can I put decorations on it? Are those decorations religious? Are they spiritual? Are they there to please the rain gods or the animals for hunting? They might have other meanings and that's also art. Art transcends, but art to me in a modern, de my personal definition of art is, uh, all right, I'm going to go. So first of all, art is the yin to the yang for all the crap we do that there's a sense of I want I like this pretty furniture or look at this necklace I'm wearing. Mm. That to me is all the art, the artisan, the beauty, the need, the, this music I'm going to listen to. Um, that's what art is. And and it's just it's the other side for all the crap for the, the shelling and destroying of a country for the the raping and pillaging of people for, you know, marching people to death camps to, mm -hmm. or marching Native Americans and the, you know, the march of tear, you know, all one after the other, just going on all the time. So that's the yin to that. And it's yeah. in everything. So that's what art is at its purest. It has nothing to do with galleries, has nothing to do with taste, has nothing to do with Western art versus Latin art versus Asiatic art versus Ocean, you know, it's Africa. It's, it's just, it's all, but they all have it. They all, I don't care what culture you go to, there's a decorative level from the yeah. indigenous people to this and they cross pollinate and they some you know, the primitive, what I'm gonna use the word primitive in the most un-PC way, you know, in the old school way. But like when Picasso and Matisse were, I love their primitive collections of African masks, all of a sudden those primitive, again, quotations, uh, start to influence their art mm -hmm. but then also like people from different cultures like when japanese artists started going to europe then all of a sudden certain japanese art started taking on european yeah tendencies and and then of course like the japanese art was infecting like the impressionists like our post impressions like van gogh or monet yes. impression and and this cross pollination so it's never so i don't believe in purity either i be, i believe in impurity, I believe in fusion, I believe in appropriation, I believe oh, in yeah. that's, you know, spaghetti with tomato sauce in a <laughs> meatball is Chinese spaghetti, tomatoes from the New World, Native Americans, uh, meatballs probably from Germany, who knows? <laughs> yes. Imagine, I'm guessing, yes. I'm, man, I'm man facting it. Um, <laughs> so that to me, that's part of art. And then the other thing I would say is we try, I mentioned the word artisan, hmm. but this is what I feel the different, the artisan is the person who does the craft. 
and you do the craft and you pass it on to your children who do it. So like, you know, if you're painting plates in the town of Orvieto in Northern Italy, and you're doing these amazing scallop shapes and gorgeous colors. And if you ever watch them painting, they'll do it on the street. You're just like, how does anybody have that steady hand to just do this and this and this? And it's yeah, yeah. incredible. And, and, you know, and so artisanship is this, it's this craft ability and cooking would be like having great knife work, mm-hmm. you know, like being able, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God, how can you chop that fast? You know? Um, but there's a difference between an artist and an artisan. And I feel like the artist is the, the, it's the artisan, like the, 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 you know, maybe the, the daughter, she's like, you know, her, her father, her grandfather, her great grandmother, they're whatever, they're all painting plates. And she goes to the next town and she sees somebody not doing the scalp or not using this color, but they're using a different pigment mm. and a different shape. And she's like, I kind of like this. And she goes back to her family to do the plates. And then she starts putting it in and they're going, Get got so fine, you know, what's wrong with you? And like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've been doing this like this for 500 years and now yeah, you're yeah. stop. And but what she did, she's the little bit of sand in the oyster. Mm-hmm. And she creates this pearl because now it's been infected. And now she's created something that's not in the other town and not in her family. And now this like this new thing. And then all of a sudden it first gets a little slapped up and beaten up by the Mm -hmm. critics. In this case, it's her family, right? It's not Mm -hmm. like the New York Times, not Jerry Saul. (laughs) Her father and grandmother, (laughs) Um, bad review. But you know what happens is then like the person down the street looks and goes, I like it. And she all of a sudden changes how all the plates look. And I feel like the artist is is the fly in the ointment. It's the, it's the, the sand in the oyster. It's the, it's the, we're the irritants Mm -hmm. and, and we're not, we're, we use like artists like you and me that aren't many, aren't relying on other people to manufacture our art. We're not outsourcing, but the ones that we're doing, we're artisans and we love the artisan aspect of it. We love it, Mm -hmm. but we're also the irritant and Mm -hmm. we want to irritate it. And we want to not be a robot. We, we want to push things and, and make things a little bit uncomfortable. And that's to me, to me, art, the art, the difference between an artist and an artisan is an artisan continues doing the craft that they were taught and they always do it well. Like going yeah. to a restaurant is artisanal because if I take you, I go, Gabriella, I just had like the best bronzino fish at this restaurant. You have to go there and have it. Mm-hmm. And let's say I had it last week. When I take you to that restaurant, that bronzino better taste exactly like I had yeah. it a week ago. Okay. And if it doesn't, I'll say, what happened last week? It tasted this and this. Even if it tastes better this week, if it doesn't taste exactly like last week, the restaurant failed. So yeah. restaurant ship, whether it's McDonald's at a low level or Daniel Ballou at a high level, they have to have a sameness, mm-hmm. a, a sort of a, a artisan, artisanal. And I think the artist... All right, I, I'm going to go on a very personal definition. I'm not going to say the. I'm not going to speak about the artist. I'll speak about me mm-hmm. as an artist. I like always being the fly in my own ointment. Mm-hmm. I always like mixing it up and not knowing. And I feel that for me, the great art of for me comes from failure mm-hmm. and from struggle and from not following the path I know. But from always, every time I do a painting, I'm always working on the unknown and I'm always making mistakes and correcting and I'm always messing up and it's always, what am I doing? Which is why when I, as a teacher, when I do demos, my demos are so much more successful than when I'm on my own, because on my demos, I'm following um, artisanal procedures. Mm, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Step two, step three. So when people are looking at me doing demos, like, oh my God, you're doing this so well. And I'm like, yeah, I should really do my own paintings as if they were demos. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But, but I I joke because that, so for my own personal thoughts of what I want to be as an artist, and I'm not talking about for you or for anyone else is I need that unknown. I need to not know the answer. Yeah. And so for me, I love the artisanal approach of mixing my own paint and using you know having my brushes and working right here and that but I that's where and but then after that I need this sense of 
what am I going to do next? And that question ha is asked multiple times a day and every single time. And even when I'm not painting, I'm looking at the painting, trying to solve puzzles. And that's what's exciting for me as an artist. But that's very personal. Yeah. And, and I do know artists that are more artisanal. And I know artists that are even more processed than me. And I guess that's product first process, which is a whole different conversation. But I do know artists who sort of know how to do what they're doing. And they're really, really good. And, you know, you can see it when they do it, especially Instagram. You know, you can see like that, you know, they they almost feel like my demos. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and you, you know, they can just knock that stuff out. Um, I, um, I, that for me, I, I'm not able to do. I, not only do I not want to do it, I'm not even sure if I'm technically skilled enough to, uh, to be at that level. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that, with that second aspect. Um, and I, I also like the differentiation of art, um, basically of craft versus art. But yeah, I don't care for, I don't care for uh, this, this uh, often artists, it, it, it's often obvious that the, that that artist person knows exactly what the next step is going to be of what they're going to do like they know already it's like this something that they have done over and over again several times and i don't care for that i much prefer what you were talking about about the just working in the unknown it's like i don't know i don't plan uh, you know in my case i don't plan my drawings out i don't know how it's going to turn out you know i have like a vague idea of something that i want to do but then it's like whether it's going to end up the way it looks in my mind's eye it's like i don't actually know okay um <clears throat> so mr wellington what uh, is uh you uh, really mr yes i'll go by <laughs> no no i just i just uh, i'm i'm uh, sometimes i'm amused by firm formality i've been reading like um charles dickens and jane austen and they refer to their characters very often as like miss uh miss elliot uh yeah. mr whatever and i'm like amused by that it, it seems i mean i don't think that's a modern thing i'm pretty sure that's something very of theirs yeah. and i'm amused by it and anyway i'm reading that stuff right now so so uh it's kind of more that's more why i'm doing it i'm not yeah. <laughs> i'm not I, saying I like, you're old or I, something no i like my sire uh-huh uh, that's what you know mon, 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 oh, monster. Monster. Uh -huh. mister okay. is, is a sire is what you know to like nobility so yes, that's a mister is my, my sire yes i see okay like a nobility i feel like oh, where's my sword <laughs> where's <laughs> my where yes okay where's where's my I need my, my suit of armor. I need my page. <laughs> <laughs> Helmet. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, what is beauty in your opinion? Oh, in my view. Uh, yes. Well, you know, I cannot say it any better than has been said. Uh, who said it was a Shakespeare or, you know, uh, <laughs> it's in the eyes of the beholder. And I, but I uh -huh. do feel that that's 100% true. I mean, you know, where can you okay. go from there? Because, and, but I mean, we'll, we'll so, so that's a line everybody knows, but what does sure. it mean? And it means like, okay, so, you know, we can all look at flowers mm -hmm. and uh, be like, oh my God, those flowers are so beautiful. And it's like, oh yeah, they're so beautiful. We're all in agreement. It's beautiful. Okay, well, that's good. Um, we're all in agreement that flowers are beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, like sometimes uh, as an artist, you know, you look at some, garbage on the street at a crushed tin can and some trash or right now i'm painting um uh broken up uh cinder blocks and brick and you know and a, and a tornado about to just do more destruction and fires and you know my paintings have fires and floods and and when i'm painting them i find them beautiful mm -hmm. in painting you know like i'm you know like right you know i'm, I'm painting a uh a tornado, <laughs> you know, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, I'm going to try and paint it beautifully, even though it's a terrifying, horrific thing. Yeah. And so beauty might be beautiful flowers, and it also might be things that might not seem beautiful. And I think for most of the artists, many of the artists I've talked to uh, that we've when we've talked about these things, is that we all, that a lot of us, I can't say all of us or everybody, but a lot of artists I know that we, uh, when we start to look at something and when we start to put our devotion into it, we find beauty. And, uh, and that is, um, you know, I'm thinking of your work, uh, but I'm, you know, I, I remember once I was in South Beach many, many years ago, my son was very young. And there are all these beautiful models that were all top, you know, European models, topless, 
and on the beach. And I would always have my sketch pad. And I was drawing this woman that was about 300 pounds who was topless. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this was a long time ago. It was like 25 years ago. And I, I think I looked a lot different. And it was, I looked the way people would approach me and flirt with me when I was sitting mm -hmm. on a beach by myself or with my son. And, uh, and I remember these two uh, girls came over and they wanted me to draw them. And they're like, why are you drawing her? She's so heavy. Why don't you draw us? And, mm -hmm. I, and I was like, they couldn't see the, and you know, this is not, a, it wasn't like I was looking at this woman and going, oh, she's, I'm sexually attracted to her. No, she was just like, there was a beauty in her form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, who, oh, well, I mean, the number of artists to celebrate it, but for me, certainly uh, um, Lucian Freud, you know, yeah. like this, you know, it's like, and, and Jen, Jenny Saville. Yeah. Well, I mentioned her before, you know, there's certain that there, but Lucian Freud before Jenny and, um, uh, you know, and sometimes you're looking at and Lucian Freud's a, like the greatest example of what is beauty, because if you look at Lucian Freud's paintings, um, he, he's got like paint rags that he's painting that are, and he's painting, uh, he does the painting out one of his studio windows, which is just like a junkyard of mm. crap, of old tires and stuff. And some, I would, I would love to steal that painting and live with it all my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have to okay. say steal because I can never afford it. So, so I would say with beauty, it's, um, you know, I think it's the artist's job. No, I don't want to put too much pressure on it. I think many artists love the aspect of finding beauty in not what maybe your everyday idea of beauty is, but we end up finding it. And I was thinking of your own work with some of your work, which is really strong and powerful, but I, you know, I'm thinking like the stuff like this, mm -hmm. but I know when you were going through this period with like the hands and it's really rough work at the mm -hmm. same time, I know when you were drawing the hands and the veins and the fingers in your mind, you distance yourself from the larger concept to go on the beauty of the veins and the beauty of the knuckles and right. Yeah. Gabrielle, am I getting that right? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So that's it. It's a very, um, it's a very large definition. Um, okay, but so um, my personal issue about the, I don't know if it's a saying, I don't know who coined it about beauty is in the eye of the beholder is that it talks about location. It talks about where it is. It does not define, it doesn't say what beauty is. So, so then it's like, all right, if you find it in a painting, if you find it in the tornado that you're painting, if you find it in the cinder blocks, if you find it in the in the overweight individual, whatever it is, or, but or what, this, what, but what case, is like in, uh, you know, I, in the, the muscular back in, of, in, in his, in, in his, in his lower trapezius. Yes. But <laughs> what is it? So, so like, that is the question. What is it? Um, wow. What? Oh, okay. Oof. Because, because like, I agree that it can be found in completely unexpected places. It can be found in things that are arguably ugly and things that are arguably horrible and terrible terrifying, you know, death, you know, arguably negative things. But then in that case, what it, what, you know, so Gabriel, what I have to ask you, have you come up with an, a definitive answer for this? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm I like, most definitely I, was, I was like, I'm like, I was hoping you would. I was like, okay, no, tell, I'm I ready. Mean, I'm ready. Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, me. I can, um, there's been a couple of things that have, uh, emerged throughout the episodes so far in common that I really liked the previous episode was, was, was with an, uh, an artist named Randy Ortiz. Mm. Um, and I liked what he said, which is that what, what he said is something, something like beauty is the, like the relationship between all those things that are, some of them are arguably cheerful and some other things are arguably dark feelings and stuff and it's like their collective presence in human feeling and you know the contrast between them according to him that is that is that beautiful sounds like or that's beauty a, yeah that sounds like a, a good personal definition i will yeah. i will say one thing um for me about my beauty in objects in my paintings i will not paint I cannot paint something if I don't find if I can't find the beauty in it mm -hmm. so whether it's fire or clouds or men or women or cinder blocks or a pear if I don't find that I want to spend time loving it yeah 
and being devotional to it. I, I don't use the word beauty. It's funny because you ask me what is beauty and it's something I don't really think about in art. I think about devotion in art, being devotional <laughs> to something. I, I think something more beauty is, yeah, all right, so I, I know I'm having trouble with it. So if we're gonna go a little bit deeper, I find the word beauty and all of that to be so superficial. Uh -huh. And so who cares? Mm -hmm. That that's why I'm not that I'm I'm now realizing why it's like you know yeah beauty is in the eyes of the beholder why it needs such a flippant response is because I just don't I just don't my brain doesn't even think in terms of beauty what I think of is okay. more religious I think devotional anything I want to be devotional to is in some way beautiful to me mm -hmm. so like I found like looking at somebody I'll just give a quick example like there's somebody you know that I'm I'm talking to I don't I'm looking at them I don't find, think of them one way or another. And then it's like, we talk and go, oh, would you do a gouache of me? And I go, okay. And we sit together when I do a gouache and in the act of doing gouache, they become beautiful to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because at that point, I'm really looking at them and I'm really devotional. So I'm going to, I'm going to read now. I'm going to give you a real definition of beauty because it, it, sometimes I have to talk it out of my head. Sure. Here. Beauty is anything I can become devotional to. Yeah. That's my definition by John Wellington, Mr. John, Wellington. <laughs> Master John Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> One sire, done. <laughs> yeah. If okay. I can be devotional, when I'm devotional, something it becomes beautiful to me. Okay. No, and that's that's those two things that you just talked about are also things that have emerged in previous episodes repeatedly. So, like the devotional aspect, in the sense that there's some there's some kind of a relationship with divinity somehow. First of all, and second of all. The other one that you said when you started painting that person in gouache when they asked you so so the the aspect of beauty as something that you have to deliberately look for. In something so like that's basically I think uh, or you know now that we're talking about it and then i'm thinking about it in relationship with other video uh, uh, other conversations that I had that it's you have to deliberately look for it and that's why you can find it anywhere basically. Right. That's basically why it can be found anywhere. It, it, um, yeah, it, this is a side note, like, so, you know, not to be too political, but, you know, there's always this temptation to do like politically minded art of the moment mm -hmm. for, you know, that, like I have friends who do it sure. and, uh, and then like, you know, it's thinking like with Trump, for example, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, given the ways I felt about him, I didn't want to spend time being devotional to his image. Does that make sure. sense? So sure. I wouldn't do an image of, I wouldn't do a painting of him because I just didn't want to spend my, my creative energies or juices and the feelings of devotion, the feelings of meditation on that image yeah, um, yeah. where someone else would feel comfortable doing that. And they would do a great thing with that image. Uh, but that's, so that's, that's, so that's what I mean. My definition is so personal. And, and it's funny that you asked me, cause I really, I don't think of, I, of course I think about beauty, but whenever I think about it, I don't think of that with it. I don't give it as much weight as devotional mm -hmm. and I, and devotional can be, you know, how anybody, you know, either it can be with however their religion dictates there, it should be, or it can be in a more, what all the religions sort of have in common, which mm -hmm. is probably more my definition is that when that it be, you, you bring it up that you probably heard me talk other times about fetishism. And, and my use of the word fetish also is more in a religious context than like leather and whips and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, in the modern concept, it's about making something more important, making an object more important than it might necessarily be, which is what I, if you can see behind me, there's like all around my whole studio are shrines. And um, that's what shrines are. It's like taking objects and giving them importance. Yeah. You know, they're objects, right? They're not God. They're not this, you know, that the writing on the TP isn't God, it's symbols, but mm -hmm. to the Native American, that symbols meant more and spoke, and that's the fetishism. And that's how I think, and because I think that's what art, that's something I respond to in art. That's why, like I talked about Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, you know, his his imagery, it's, it's a fetishism. He makes these symbols, these shapes, he does writing, and then he crosses out the writing so that you'll as he said, so you'll look harder at it. Mm -hmm, <laughs> what you mm -hmm. do, you cross out. Go, what did he cross out? And he makes <laughs> you look at it. And that's like that fetishistic thing. He makes all the he makes all these things so important, you know. And um, you know, and that's what I responded to, uh, you know, 
40 years ago was 40 something years ago was like, uh, you know, those, these images, you know, the same thing with Kiefer, he does like this Nazi, the Reichstag and, you know, this perspective and it's so horrifying, but at the same time his perspective lines, he makes these things so overwhelmingly important and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, there it's, you know, this is one of these, one of the things I really respond to in art is this idea that you make something so much more than what it is a pair is not just a pair it's a pair you know it's mm -hmm. iconic it's like <gasps> you know it's like god or something you know? yes okay well um we have reached the one hour mark and i really oh. like and i really uh i actually really like those these aspects of beauty as closing thoughts on the on on the episode um because um i mean uh, I personally haven't been able to necessarily make a, a really, uh, I mean, like a, a connection that I can explain verbally with why there is like some kind of divinity in beauty and in art, uh, which is what we do. Uh, but I like the idea of that being there um, because, well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice to think there's such an importance to what one does, you know? Um, so, okay. Um, John, please tell all our viewers and listeners what you're up to lately, where your work can be found. Is there anything you want to, anything you want to add, anything you want to talk about, anything you want to promote that um, you're working on? Sure. I, I do this with the caveat of, I've been taking a, a break. I, and this is the only time I've ever announced it. I've never announced it on social media, but I just stopped posting stuff mm -hmm. which is exactly by the way for anybody listening who wants to be involved in the art world and wants don't do what i'm doing please don't do it post uh study with dina brodsky uh find her and uh she will teach you the correct um things to do to get followers and you know gabriella has a great following and uh so don't do what i'm doing i i just um at the where i am right now i just felt like yeah you know what I, I felt myself being a little too manipulated by um, mm. social media in a way of what I should do or how would my paintings look in a, in a, in a little flip size as someone's scrolling. And it just had so little to do with why I make art. Yeah. And I felt if it was conducive and helping me, I would stick with it, but I've, I've sort of pulled away. That doesn't mean, so you can find me at John Wellington artist on Instagram, but I don't think I've posted anything in months. Um, I probably will again at some point because it's there. I just, want to make sure that I'm using it as a medium and it's not using me. Yeah. And that's a weird thing to do. You know, I don't want to be looking at likes or any of that. I, I just, yeah. um, you know, it's funny that you, that you're like uh, almost like warning kind of, or, or asking of, of fellow artists to not do what you're doing, because that's exactly what I'm doing because, because actually, because similarly to political things like you were talking about a second ago, it's like, or for me, you know, I, I just think it's kind of similar to what you were saying, but for me, it's like that thing or whatever it is does not deserve the airtime in my head. Like, it's like, it does not deserve to occupy time in my thoughts. It, it was so, starting to take more time for me and uh, like that. And, I, and I'm not as intuitive about it uh, you know i don't have the brilliance of dina of dina brodsky and so dina can do it and still have time with her kids and still right. have time to do great art i just don't have i'm not as smart as her <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not sure it's necessarily a matter of intelligence and lots of people uh lots of people have talked about about how the it's it's deliberately made so that we will want to be more on it yeah because it's like our attention is what they're vying for what the you know whatever because it's a business and it's like yeah. our attention is valuable and all that stuff but it's like i don't think you're at fault at all and i don't think your intelligence needs to be brought into question for not wanting to capitulate and to want to and and because you want to like you know it's funny because i said something almost exactly the same as what you said just now in the previous episode with randy ortiz oh, it, wow. because because what i said is i want to i want to tr I want to bring the, the control back to me rather than it the you know because it's an it it's an object um rather than it dominating my thoughts and 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 myself and allowing myself to get full of anxiety because i am letting it control me 
Right. So it's like, so, so it's like, yeah, I don't, I no, that is a, that is a bullshit ass relationship. And it's like, it's a tool, just like a pencil, just like the paper. Yeah. And it's like, I am, am like, um, calibrating and fixing the relationship slowly yeah. to make it a tool again. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I mean, I agree. I, I do think though, like, let's say there's like someone who's like in their twenties and they're like, I want to want, I want gallery shows. I want this, I want that. I would say use it, study the algorithms, um, TikTok, uh, vid do videos, don't worry about still photos. And there's all these rules to do it if you if you want to do it. I think it's a great tool. Yeah. Um, galleries, as Dina said, has said to me, you know, galleries, they don't they don't even care. She said, you know, have she goes, half my followers are like 13 year old girls gallery. <laughs> but these old white gallery guys don't even know that they just can't believe you have, you know, a million followers or something or I don't know how many followers Dina has now, but probably quite a lot. And and they're just so impressed by that. So these things are important for a certain way of marketing yourself. And that's why I don't right. want to, that's why I don't want to be like, this is what I'm doing and you shouldn't do it either. I'm just, this is very personal. And it's, it's also like, I'm one of the things I love about tactile painting, touching this stuff and feeling the bumps of impasto and everything. And why I'm not doing digital art, which I, I love, you know, digital, it's fun to work with procreate mm -hmm. stuff, but I love the tactile thing. I like clay. I like paint and, and um, I like looking at real paintings yeah. and this idea of reproduction now where I'm scrolling through like friends images that are this small and I'm going like this, like, 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 yeah. it's like, it's so like antithesis of how I want to experience art. Yeah. And so I have like, and I don't want people experiencing my art like that either. So it's yeah. like, it's a weird thing. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a, weird at all. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a definitive answer yet. You can tell I'm kind of like, uh, you know, so. yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it's definitely normal to have trepidations on the subject. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's a new, the whole, I mean, the whole concept of social media is yet another variable that we have to juggle with as uh, just em e everything. It's anything. like, oh, the amount of information, just everything. It's like stuff that we have to juggle with and we have to like let it be in like the collective consciousness for a while to learn more about it and see what yeah. kind of stuff we can do with it, you know? So, okay. So if someone wants to see my work, you yeah. have to go really, really old school. Okay. You have to go to a website. <laughs> 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 really old school way back yeah. when people had websites and you had to dot ww didn't know so if you just johnwellington.com and for that my my uh, web designer and friend uh glenn westrom who first started designing my website in 2000 and has updated we've done it where you can actually really click on it and get like these super resolutions of paintings still not the real painting it's still not the real right. thing but at least you can zoom in close enough yes to see paint because sometimes people think my paintings are flat in fact you can read my paintings like braille you know it's <laughs> yeah. like there's bumps and mistakes and all these different things in them that sometimes in reproduction all clean up really nicely so in in johnwellington.com you can actually see my work i just started i just put a new section in called pinups and the reason okay. for that is is because well for people who know my work uh, a lot of people, you know, my work has had its moments of controversy for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly for the object objectifications uh, of alleged alleged objectification. I no, mean, uh, objecti say, objectification according to other people. Yeah, I'm going to say objectification. I'm going to own it because I'm going to say that whatever I paint, I objectify. If it's a cloud, yeah. I objectify the cloud. I objectify my cinder block. I objectify my bricks. I objectify my humans. I objectify yeah. the bows, the arrows, the water. I objectify everything. I mean, I am the biggest objectifier <laughs> ever. I'm going to own it so completely. If it's a factory I'm painting, I'm objectifying the broken glass in the windows. I'm, if I'm not objectifying, I'm not doing what I love to do. I objectify everything. So but people don't get upset when I objectify a brick, but they might get upset when I objectify uh, a woman or a man or whatever. So they, they don't get upset that I'm objectifying. It's just what I'm objectifying. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm not going to back away from objectification. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, but uh, I decided that I, I'm going to tell a quick story and you can edit this out because it'll be too long. But I, um, I have a childhood, again, just going back to my childhood. 
my mom in 1969, 1970, my mom brought me to Paris and uh, we lived in Paris before, but we we're going back at this point as living in Greenwich Village. And we stayed at a photographer's house in the right bank, a home mm -hmm. apartment. Uh, his name is Gene, was Gene Fenn. He died. He was actually a very famous photographer, American, photo American in Paris, very, very well-known photographer. I didn't know that. What I did know is he had a pile of Playboys uh -huh. on the, uh, uh, lying around, like stacks. And while they were going out and running around, they would let me hang out. And as so uh, in third grade, I don't know how old I was. Uh, I, I was, of course, exposed to lots of things. But, you know, uh, what? so I, I was allowed to go through the Playboys. And I opened up all the Playboys, not to the nude photos, but to this painting in the center, near the center of each one, there was a painting of a mm -hmm. woman. And the painting was by Antonio Vargas, this mm -hmm. wonderful, he's not from Panama, is he from Panama? I, I don't, he's not that I know of. Somewhere near, near you. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, he was a pinup artist and a great one. And I loved these pinups. And so I did drawings and copied them. Uh, and that's what I did besides running around and eating crepes and other things as mm -hmm. I was drawing. I didn't know who Vargas was, but I was drawing these and I loved, and I didn't just love the nude women, which of course I did, but they're tinted. But I love the way he, he uh, rendered reflections on metal and like, uh -huh. leather, like wearing a belt or boots or transparent clothing. Like it was so like insanely amazing to me. And I realized that this has stayed with me all my life. And so I was doing like, I was doing these, these some of these women in my paintings were very pinup-y, although that they were doing real kick-ass stuff and they mm -hmm. were often the heroes of my paintings. But in his work, they were the heroes too. You know, they were either cowboy pinup or this pinup or that, you know, they were like Wonder Woman, right? Mm -hmm. Like she's a pinup, but she's also yes. a kick-ass superhero. Yes. And um, so I was kind of like, in that tradition and I didn't have them. And I, there's a part of me that's always like trying to shy away. Okay, yeah, I know that I know I'm objectifying. I know you hate me because of this, but I don't want to own it. And then I was like, you know what, fuck that. And <laughs> yeah. so I, I talked to Glenn and I said, Glenn, you know, I just, and I had done a talk on a painting that was very pinuppy. And um, although it's called, um, what was it? it's, it's called uh, Ar Artemis uh, Triumphant. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's holding a bow and there's this like very phallic bunker temple in the back uh -huh. burning. And she's obviously the victor and this male structure is definitely gone. And, you know, so she's the hero, um, but she's also voluptuous and very pin in this Vargas way. And I was like, you know what? I need to own it. Yeah. You go on my website as of four weeks ago, there is a, it says pinups and it's this period of where you know, it's this objective, you know, I'm going to use the modern idea. Yes, I'm objective fun. Yes, you can hate me. I'm objectifying these. But they're also like these really powerful yeah. humans. And, um, and so in my website now, I now have pinups. I'm finally embracing it. And I'm, and I'm thanking the late and great Jean Fenn in Paris. It's American in Paris that we stayed in for free <laughs> days in 1969, 1970. Okay. Uh, that's it. And there's a series of ebooks that you can find that are of my uh, uh, on my website that you can through buy through Apple uh, about my process of being an artist that are centered around sketchbooks and how uh, a word or a sketch, even the simplest little sketch, can eventually become like a four month painting. And it's really the good and the bad and the ugly of the creative process. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds really good. And I like the, the pinup information. That sounds awesome as a, a new body of work. You know, um, and there's a couple of older paint. Um, when I say older paintings over the last five or six years, I brought into it that mm -hmm. we said, oh, that fits into this. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, that makes sense that it would kind of like creep up in yeah. your, in your work until, until it, you can't avoid it anymore. Basically. That's what happened. <laughs> okay. <laughs> happened. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, uh, John, for joining me. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your words and thank you for your thoughts. Thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to let John and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments section. I also invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because more of these conversations are coming. I also invite you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals. 
If you want to support John, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links are in the video description. So see you next time, everyone, and thank you very much. Bye.